Thank you for giving up your uh, Monday afternoons to be here. My name is Erica Harper. I'm the Head of Research and Policy Studies at the Geneva Academy for International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights. Um, big thank you to Esgi for inviting us to co-host this important um, piece of work. And the team at the Graduate Institute did the lion's share of the work here. So a huge congratulations on bringing together this uh, really interesting group. It's a fairly packed panel, so I'm just going to make a couple of really quick points. First, to underscore not just the uh, importance of the topic, but the breadth of importance of the topic. So at the Academy, we don't work directly on uh, torture as human rights violation or at all of war, but we do do a lot of work on neurotechnologies and uh, digital military technologies. And absolutely there, um, the number one concern is trade regulation. And what we're seeing as uh, neurotech companies become the principal um, producers and disseminators of technology, um, you know, they're following their consumers. And even though most of the time these are legitimate and benign, <coughs> benign users, it can also be non-state armed groups or uh, fringe political parties. And this creates, um, you know, when we have this content plus these entities, uh, this trend of gravi companies gravitating to the regulatory context, which is the most flexible and inviting, we have a, a huge body of risk. And I think even though the human rights and business community of practice have been sounding the alarm bells for a really long time, we're still not nearly at a point where we can um, balance beneficial innovation with um, a strong capacity to protect. Uh, so just to say that this is you know, a hugely important debate and progress made here will ripple across to other fields of interest. Um, and second point is about future proofing. Um, and when I first looked at this topic, like my mind absolutely went just to you know stun guns and pepper spray and stuff. But um, and I'm sure all the panelists know this. Like we're also going to be talking about uh, digital uh, technologies, and you know with machine learning, these technologies are becoming cheaper. They're um, they're much more easier to cross international boundaries. Um, certainly in our work, we're looking at how digital, military, neurotech, um, through a human rights lens, can be used for, for torture. And so this is far from, you know, science fiction. This is part of our, our current um, debate. Um, so I guess for you guys, when you're talking about regulation, it, it can't just be for here and now. We've got to be thinking what, you know, could, might, will be um, the future of these technologies and, you know, looking for a framework that you know, at worst or well at best isn't just going to become redundant um, and perhaps at worst it becomes a kind of a get around framework for um, the entities with, which don't have human rights at the centre of their thinking to, to leverage. Um, so again, thank you to Esgi. Um, I'm not going to, I'm going to turn over to people who can contribute much more substance, but really looking forward to this discussion. And um, I hand the floor over to you, Esgi. Thanks. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Erica, for this uh, introductory remarks, and as you remarked, we had a great line of speakers here. And uh, maybe I will just, in the interest of time, I will just start us off with uh, someone connecting to us online, Michael Crowley from the Omega Foundation. Michael right now is in The Hague because there's a review conference for the Chemical Weapons Convention, so he's following that. Because of that, Michael couldn't be here, but I thought he's the perfect person to start us off. So. My question to Michael is this. Um, so Michael, can you tell us more about the types of torture, tool, torture tools out there on the market, which are generally divided into two groups, uh, inherently abusive goods and law enforcement equipment that can be misused for torture? Okay. Hello, everyone, and uh, from The Hague. Uh, and it's great, uh, it's great to be here, uh, or there, I should say, uh, remotely. So um, since our establishment in, in, in 1990, um, Omega's work ha has been to investigate um, the, the trade and production and promotion of, of tools of torture. So, uh, and we uh, try and collect and analyze the primary materials that are produced by the manufacturing and marketing companies themselves that detail their products. So we're trying to get, you know, the the uh, um, um, the raw material um, um, 
and analyze that as well as looking at open source information on, on the sales of goods and propose and actual transfers and then also evidence of their use to commit human rights violations in the recipient countries. So it's clear from, from our research that this trade is international in nature with many companies promoting and supplying their products to correctional and law enforcement bodies within their own countries to other states in their regions and also to customers worldwide uh, whilst most of the or much of the global marketing is conducted nowadays via the internet omega also monitors over 50 specialized international arms and equipment trade fairs and exhibitions where law enforcement equipment that can be used for torture is marketed. So that's one thing I really want to um, get over that it is an international uh, uh, trade. Um, and these fairs are held regularly in at least uh, 38 countries, mostly on an annual or a biannual basis. And in many instances, they're facilitated and supported by the host state. So it's 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 you know commercial activities, but supported by states. Um, so as um, Esgi um, asked, um, we found two types of equipment uh, uh, through our studies. So firstly, there is equipment that is specifically designed, or that has no practical use other than for torture or ill treatment. And um, whilst certain types of this equipment has been manufactured by only a, a limited number of companies in a narrow range of states, such products have been marketed internationally through the internet and at arms fairs. And they've ranged from crude devices that are almost medieval uh, to the most sophisticated fruits of contemporary design technology. And they include, just to give you a range, um, Electroshock devices such as stun belts, stun vests, and stun cuffs that are designed to be attached directly to prisoners' bodies. They are worn sometimes for many hours at a time with the constant threat that they can be triggered at any moment by remote control. And in the case of stun belts, will deliver a 50,000 volt electric shock via the electrodes um, placed near the prisoner's kidneys. And in addition to excruciating pain, such devices can cause involuntary urination and defecation. So they are clearly degrading uh, to the dignity of the prisoner. Then there's a range of direct contact electroshock weapons and devices, including shock batons, stun guns, shock shields, electroshock gloves, electroshock grabbing devices that allow repeated application of extremely painful electric shocks to the most sensitive parts of a prisoner's body at the push of a button. Then there are a range of um, abusive mechanical restraints that <coughs> severely restrict movement, risk serious injury, and which are likely to cause intense physical pain, and as well as mental suffering, and again degrade the dignity of the prisoner. They include thumb cuffs, leg irons, heavily weighted leg restraints, neck restraints, metal restraint chairs, cage beds and restraints designed to be bolted to prison walls, floors, and ceilings. Uh, abusive handheld kinetic impact or striking weapons that are designed to increase and not minimize the amount of pain and injury inflicted on the subjects. They include spiked batons, spiked or serrated shields, spiked arm armor, weighted batons and shambox. And then finally, abusive or harmful kinetic impact projectiles that include intrinsically dangerous or inaccurate single projectiles, rubberized buckshot, ammunition with multiple projectiles, as well as overly powerful multiple barrel launchers that have collectively resulted in blindings, serious injuries and deaths across the world. So um, this range of inherently abusive equipment is actively promoted to the law enforcement community, as I said, in all regions of the world. And we believe that the production, trade and use of all such equipment must be ended. The second distinct category of goods of concern is law enforcement equipment, which can have a legitimate function if used in compliance with international human rights law, but which can and are readily misused for torture and other ill treatment. And this encompasses a broad range of goods, many of which are mass produced and traded on a significant scale by a large number of companies throughout the world. So on a far greater scale than the first category of, of inherently abusive goods. And this includes uh, um, goods that you'll all be aware of. So equipment for restraining human beings, such as ordinary handcuffs and leg cuffs, um, combination cuffs and spit guards that can be legitimately used 
to ensure safe arrest and restraint of prisoners and other detainees. Projectile are shock weapons, commonly called tasers, which fire darts at a distance, delivering an electric shock that causes the subject to lose muscle control and can temporarily incapacitate violent individuals. Uh, a range of chemical irritants, such as tear gas and pepper spray, and the associated dispersal mechanisms, um, such as handheld sprayers or, or single-barrel projectile launchers to disperse a limited amount of chemical irritant over relatively short distances, handheld striking weapons, batons, single-barrel launchers, and non-metallic kinetic impact projectiles like rubber bullets, plastic bullets, and, and such. And much of this second category of equipment is part of the standard inventory carried by law enforcement officials, or to which they have access in specific circumstances, such as for law and uh, for crowd control. When used appropriately, in line with the manufacturer's instructions and according to international human rights law and use of force standards, this equipment can facilitate the safe and legitimate application of proportionate force. However, human rights organisations have documented widespread misuse of such equipment by law enforcement officials in serious human rights violations, including torture. And they are used in and misused in custodial settings, so prisons, police stations, secure medical facilities during arrest and transportation, and also on the streets in public protests that Verity will talk about. And consequently, the export and transit of all such goods we believe is strictly controlled, with no transfers authorised to law enforcement agencies or other state entities that are likely to misuse them for torture. That's an overview. I hope that's uh, okay. Thank you, Michael. Uh, it's a great overview. As you can see, the range is really wide here, and it's important that we actually take a look at these goods and how they're used. Now I'm going to turn to my co-moderator, Nico Krish. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Nico Krish here of the Credit Institute and of the Global Governance Center. I'm very happy to be part of this conversation, though really kind of more to ask questions uh, in light of the rather depressing, uh, depressing overview that we've just, just heard from Michael. I wanted to turn to Verity Coy, the senior advisor to Amnesty International. Uh, thank you for being with us uh, today. Um, Michael has already kind of mentioned uh, kind of a particular angle. Amnesty International, of course, comes into this debate from kind of many directions, but there's a particular angle that has to do with protest. And you've recently launched the Protect the Protest campaign. Can you tell us a little bit more about the vision behind that and how it links to this kind of discussion and what was the, where did the need for that new campaign came for, come from? Absolutely, Nico. Thank you. And it's, it's really lovely to be here with all of you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, all of Amnesty's campaigns come from our research. They come from us witnessing human rights abuses around the world and thinking about what the correct response to that might be. So in this case, the right to protest we see as being under unprecedented and growing threat across all regions of the world. So our new campaign exists to confront states widening and intensifying efforts to erode this fundamental human right. Put simply, our goal of Protect the Protest campaign is for all people to be able to take peaceful action and make their voices heard safely and without repercussions. We call on governments to send a clear signal that protesters should be protected in law and practice and to ensure that they are facilitated and not attacked. The authorities must take urgent measures to remove all barriers to this protest and any undue restrictions that have been put in place to obstruct peaceful protest before, during and after an assembly. And that's where this particular area of work fits in. When we have a global campaign like this, we look at many different areas. So we're looking at internet suppression, we're looking at restrictive and repressive laws. But in terms of the tools Michael just spoke about, we believe that one way to protect protesters is to work towards a torture-free trade treaty. And by that, we would like to see a prohibition on some of the most horrendous and abhorrent pieces of equipment that Michael just mentioned. We believe that they exist and serve no purpose other than to commit torture and therefore should be prohibited. Their manufacture, trade and use. Then there's another category, like Michael said, 
of standard everyday police equipment that does serve a legitimate function when used correctly, but when used to commit torture, should have human rights-based risk assessments put on the trade of that, so that where we see um, these crimes taking place, responsible governments can make a decision as they would do through the arms trade, which, which I know a colleague is going to speak about also, about whether that trade should take place or not. So a torture-free trade treaty would um, keep protesters safer by doing that, but it would also help transparency, because at the moment, when we try and look at the trade in these goods, it's very opaque, we're not really sure who's trading what, where it's going to, Many of the pieces of equipment are not as easily traceable post-delivery as conventional weapons. So the treaty would help with transparency, it would help us know where these weapons are going. Um, there is more I could say about Protect the Protest, but I think the, the point of today is to talk about the tools of torture and what we think the response could be to tackle that. I'll leave it there. Thanks. So these tools are, as you mentioned, they can be misused and abused. And luckily, there are some attempts to regulate them, at least on the regional level. And here we are uh, really privileged to have um, uh, Ambassador Thomas Wagner with us, who is also the uh, Deputy Permanent Representative of the EU delegation in Geneva. I would like to turn to now uh, Ambassador Wagner and ask him to tell us a bit about the EU-wide regulation of these tools. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'll, I'm going to make a briefly present the EU's anti-torture regulation, which serves as a basis to the torture-free trade initiative since it has, was launched in 2017. And I also touch upon the progress achieved so far through this initiative. As you know, torture is a crime under international law that cannot be justified under any circumstances. And in addition, more and more countries have committed in recent decades to abolishing capital punishment, any inhumane treatment and practices. However, despite these commitments and the absolute prohibition of torture, the instruments of torture are still being traded freely across borders, and there are no international human rights tools that allow at the global level to end the trade in this kind of goods. So the EU's anti-torture regulation has, has since 2005 reflected the EU's commitment to the eradication of torture and the death penalty through measures aimed at preventing the trade in certain goods that could be used for capital punishment or torture. The EU anti-torture regulation does four things, basically. First, it prohibits exports and imports of goods that have no practical use other than for the purpose of capital punishment or for the purpose of torture. Second, it makes exports of goods that could be used for capital punishment or torture subject to a prior export authorization that has to be issued by the competent authorities of the EU member state. Third, it regulates the trade in certain pharmaceutical chemicals which could be used for uh, lethal injection executions without limiting trade of such chemicals for legitimate purposes. And finally, it sets out the destinations to which a European Union export authorization applies because those countries or territories have abolished capital punishment for all crimes and confirmed that abolition through an international commitment. Looking forward, the EU continues to pay special attention to whether there are technological developments, the kind of will be mentioned uh, by the previous speakers, like digital and other issues, or new products that require additional action. And we also keep an eye on the use of certain law enforcement equipment in policing practices, and to what extent these are being documented as tools for inhumane and degrading treatment. And God knows, we just heard from I think Michael that there are many many uh, equipments out there which need to be looked carefully at. And earlier this year, we reaffirmed that our, uh, our commitment to continue to promote the Global Alliance for Torture-Free Trade and consider further steps to ban trade in goods used for capital punishment and torture following a report which was issued in 2022 by the UN Group of Governable Experts. So the EU also continues to invest in the Alliance for Torture with the aim of uh, no, sorry, not the Alliance for Torture, the Alliance for Torture Free Trade. Sorry, that was a word, that bad one. <laughs> Sometimes you might want to compress the speech and then you will come out totally wrong. So the torture, <laughs> the Alliance for Torture Free Trade, with the aim of bringing the standards of the EU regulation 
to a global level. Over 60 countries around the world, among which the 27 EU member states, member states obviously, are now part of the alliance. Alliance members commit to take effective measures to restrict this type of trade, provide technical assistance to other countries, exchange best practices, and explore the possibility of negotiating an international, uh, internationally legally binding instrument, putting an end to the trade in goods used for capital punishment or torture. And finally, we also took good note of the more than 30 international organizations that joined forces to call for an international treaty to control the trade in tools of torture used to suppress peaceful protests and abuse detainees around the world. In a declaration signed in London in January 2023, human rights NGOs called for a treaty to prohibit the manufacture and trade in inherently abusive equipment, as well as the introduction of human rights-based controls on the trade in more standard law enforcement equipment. So all this is actually very relevant in today's world where we see, and they're coming back to our daily business here in the human rights field in Geneva, where we see uh, actually a rising authoritarian trend in many governments around the world. Uh, uh, so unfortunately, we cannot say that torture of inhumane treatment of vulnerable people in vulnerable situations is a decreasing trend, on the contrary. So all this makes it even more important to have this type of debate, discussion, to, to see how we can master this challenge and somehow do what we can collectively to, uh, to, uh, well, to, to limit yes, the, the, the trade which would be misused for, for torture purposes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so we, we're seeing kind of the broader, beginning to see the broader landscape, really, kind of, of different approaches and obviously the problem of tea. I wanted to turn, turn to Alice Edwards, who is with us online, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur for on Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman, or Degrading Treatment or Punishment. Thanks so much for being with us this afternoon. Um, now, you've just called this to call for input on a report on the topic we're discussing here. Um, and so I'd like to hear a little bit more about kind of your stance on this, how, uh, kind of how important uh, kind of is it, kind of how do you see that potential report uh, in the future contributing to the broader movement towards a potential treaty or other form of regulation or progress on uh, combating trade and torture tools? Great. Thanks uh, to the Geneva Academy and the Graduate Institute for holding this very timely uh, event. Uh, indeed, I have just uh, closed uh, the opportunity for states and other stakeholders to contribute to my forthcoming report to the General Assembly uh, in October, which will focus on exactly what we're discussing today. And I think in terms of, you know, why the report uh, now, I think it's, uh, you know, there are numerous regimes that regulate trade in items deemed to present as human rights or national security risks due to their technical specifications and or their actual or potential uses or misuses. We are in an era of a growth of state and corporate accountability for human rights violations and recognition that in particular corporations have responsibilities and a role in preventing and mitigating the adverse human rights impacts uh, that could be directly linked, for example, to their operations, products or services. And yet there is currently no international or multilateral agreement governing trade in items intended for torture or being used uh, for torture purposes. Um, I noted in my first report to the General Assembly uh, last year that uh, and I called for a total ban on equipment, weapons or devices that are defined for or inflict unnecessary harm or that are inherently harmful. Um, I, I would emphasize that I think this is an area that is uh, one of few that is remains unregulated in the uh, prohibition and prevention of torture field, but not without existing obligations. Uh, so what we're looking at and what I'd like to contribute to is how states can best uh, collectively come up with a mechanism in which they can uh, have an ongoing list of banning certain types of equipment uh, and also 
uh, looking at how they can have risk assessments, but also early warning systems about potentially uh, violent or torturous circumstances that may trigger uh, an appropriate response uh, from the state. So I'm very grateful to the Amiga uh, Institute and Michael O'Neill and their team who are actually contributing to my report. And I hope that I'll be able to uh, through some of their research, present a, a better picture of the data set. It was already commented that uh, we're not quite clear exactly where this trade is. There's a lack of transparency and so forth. So we'll be hopefully presenting at least to some extent the scale and geographical scope, as well as I've asked states to contribute around their national or regional regulations uh, that are governing the trade. Um, but also the production and use uh, in their own societies. And I also hope to present some views on different elements uh, to that uh, uh, potential international agreement. There are a number of areas that are uh, up for discussion and debate. And as Special Rapporteur on Torture, I think that's an important uh, role I can play. And I just want to say, apart from Amiga, I have um, also be I will also be and am working with the Sydney Austin law firm that are providing very good pro bono advice on different trade regimes so we can learn the lessons of other trade systems that are out there and what uh, the questions of compatibility and so forth which will hopefully help us move forward in this thanks a lot uh, thank you uh, so we also have another parallel process because we heard about the EU, we heard about the, the, the initiatives by the Special Rapporteur on Torture, but we also had another parallel process at the UN level, a UN process led by Asker Kiram here. He's the former chair of the UN Group of Governmental Experts on Torture Free Trade, and they successfully completed a report on this topic as well. So I want to ask Asker about this process and about this report, and maybe he can also share some of the findings coming out of this report. Uh, thanks a lot, Eski, and thanks a lot to the Geneva Academy and the Graduate Institute for, for hosting this important event. Uh, I think you're being very generous when you call me the leader of, of, of this process. Uh, but uh, so, so maybe let me just explain first very briefly what, what this process actually uh, is. Because in fact, so I uh, am the former chairperson of the group of uh, governmental experts on the total free trade in the UN. Um, and this group was set up as actually a step in a longer process towards trying to have uh, binding international uh, standards uh, on this topic. So it was the group was uh, created by a UNGA resolution um, and asked to, and let me try to just quote this correctly because it it's kind of adds to the picture of some of the confusion to present draft parameters for a range of options to establish common international standards in this field. So I guess that's a, quite an, a, a good example of interesting UN language. Um, but so the, the group was first set up um, in uh, started work in October 2021 um, and uh, had to submit a report to the GA in May 22. So the group effectively existed for around seven months, um, held a number of uh, meetings uh, online, and uh, and then produ largely produced the report uh, through a written process. Uh, so this is just to give the very snap uh, overview of, let's say, the, the process that the group went through. The, the report is published. I think it speaks for itself. And also since I'm no longer, the, the group no longer exists, uh, rather than speaking as the chair of the group, I'm gonna try to share uh, just a few of the impressions that, uh, that I got uh, and lessons learned uh, through the work of, um, of this group. So, so I think the, I guess what is actually most important to me and what, what became very clear is that a large part of the, the problems that we see with torture happening in the world where tools are being used belongs in the group that we call the control group or the tools that could be used 
uh, for torture and ill-treatment. It's not everything, just to be clear, there's a, a good chunk in, in the group of inherently abusive uh, equipment as well that we see being used a lot, but, but there is a very big group that, uh, of the equipment that belongs in, uh, in the control group. And that is important to remember as we move forward in our discussions, because this is also the group that is the most tricky to regulate, both in terms of trying to have a, a, an informed discussion about it, in terms of, let's say, political opposition, political controversy, but also legal complications. And those are some of the things that came out very clearly in the discussion within the group. So, so just to give a little bit of a flavor of some of the, uh, some of the issues that came out, out. So first of all, there is a great deal of confusion still about what, how to delineate the group of tools that may put, potentially get onto this list. Uh, Omega has done wonderful work on this. So I would say that part of the confusion is deliberate on, on the part of, of, uh, of, uh, of people who are maybe not so interested in this area being regulated or see it as problematic. But there is also genuine confusion about how far does this extend, which connects with concerns that there will be uh, undue restrictions on um, on trade in, let's say, normal uh, <clears throat> normal goods. So that's that's kind of that's kind of one one part of it. The second part that came out in the group's discussions around this specific issue is. Uh, concerns uh, again, the more more fundamental or principal concerns that this, we shouldn't produce regulation that has this element of this larger element of uncertainty in terms of when you cannot can or cannot trade uh, in these tools. Again, personally, and as also an employee of the ICT, I very firmly believe that they should be regulated. I'm just trying to convey some of the challenges that were seen within the group so that this can be taken into account uh, in any process moving forward. The third element is more of a legal nature. So for those who have, uh, who have had the, the energy to go through the whole uh, report, you will notice that the group proposes the evidentiary um, standard of reasonable grounds to believe as one that could be applied in the context of uh, assessing whether tools can be, uh, this group of tools can be exported or not. The reason why the group chose this particular standard is because that is the standard that is most often being used by UN fact-finding missions and uh, commissions of inquiry. So, so it was a well-known standard in the UN system and it was also a standard that would allow these types of mechanisms to inform decision making in relation to the risk when a trade authority would have to to determine whether tools can be transported or not. I, I realize this is a bit complicated, so I hope I'm conveying it in uh, in in clear terms. Um, but but that just a couple of comments on that. First of all, what we the group did realize when we were having these discussions was that one challenge that may come up when we get if we foresee that we have international standards in the future is actually having an evidentiary standard that uh, you have sufficient uh, and uh, let's say credible evidence collection that can populate it. Because when trade authorities are forced to look at, say, okay, let's say my country, Denmark, we're, we're exporting um, uh, tools to country X, then they need to figure out what's going on in country X and where do they get the sources from that. So it is important to think about having, having a system here of monitoring and evidentiary standards that actually work in practice. Um, so, so, so that's... That's, I'm happy to elaborate more, but, but this, I'm going to try to keep this short um, for now at least. The, the last point, and I think this is important, there is a, a big uh, missing element in the group's proposal uh, for reasonable grounds to believe. 
And that is that reasonable grounds to believe is a standard that is created for mm. fact finding. And what we are actually talking about here is risk assessment. So uh, I can elaborate if you want on why the group could not get into that level of detail in its report. Uh, but, but personally, I think there is a big uh, job still to be done and looking at how do we actually merge this. So there may be inspiration to be found, for example, uh, from the risk assessment that's being done in relation to rifle man cases, which is something where you also have to make an assessment of the risk of torture happening in the future. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so, so those are really some of the, some of the, the, key challenges that were seen in the group. I think the last point, uh, and I, I realize that's not the main topic of discussion uh, today, but I think it also comes out quite clearly in, in the report, is that when you get into the details of these kind of discussions, um, it is quite difficult to discuss torture and death penalty at the same time. It, I'm not saying it's not worth doing it. I think though both areas are important to regulate, but both the technical complications around how do you regulate these tools are slightly different, but the, polit the motives for political opposition to the regulation of <clears throat> these two groups uh, is also um, very, uh, very different where the opposition in the area of death penalty, at least to a certain extent, comes from an a more or less expressed desire to continue to be able to have the death penalty and use it. The opposition to regulating torture tools very rarely comes from people who say, in a way, we actually want to continue to torture people. Uh, so, so please let us have these tools, right? I mean, the opposition is, is much more complex around the links with trade and complication, and probably also a broader opposition to the uh, adoption of any future international standards. So, so I hope that uh, I hope that that conveys some of the lessons that the group has learned, and uh, and I look forward to to sharing more. If, uh, thanks a lot for giving me the time. Thanks a lot, Asker. I think uh, that was really uh, kind of enormously uh, interesting and important kind of attempt at disassembling the many different construction sites that you are facing there and giving us a good insight in the, into the report. Now, obviously, much of what you've said just now kind of is, is about the challenges of actually regulating a field of that uh, degree of complexity. And I want to turn to Professor Andrew Clapham, a colleague of mine here at the Goethe Institute, the International Law Department, uh, who is only an expert in international human rights and uh, humanitarian law, the laws of war, but he's also been uh, very engaged in the elaboration of the arms trade treaty and is an expert of that. And I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the, so what is out there already in terms of regulatory tools in international law and beyond that, uh, kind of that might capture some of those uh, torture tools um, in a bit present. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think it's worth thinking like a lawyer for a bit about some of these terms and, and some of the problems. So if you take the, the title of this panel and also the title of the instrument that's been proposed, if we talk about torture free trade, there's a kind of ambiguity there. Um, is it about free trade or is it torture free trade? Um, and I quite like that ambiguity because I think it sort of might encourage people who are interested in free trade to sort of get interested in this and then realize that free trade is not the greatest thing ever because we don't want trade in torture. Um, but there's a serious point here, and that is that in the arms trade treaty, which you've mentioned and other people have mentioned, there was a bit of a misunderstanding in that governments thought this was a treaty about trade. And some governments who are um, even in this room are sent trade experts and their department of uh, economics and uh, things like that to the arms trade treaty negotiations instead of human rights experts and IHL experts. So this is not about ensuring trade. This is about preventing trade. And that's nothing to do with trade law. It's, it's a very different kind of exercise. And I wanted to just focus a bit on this whole concept of trade because maybe it's a bit problematic here when you think about it. Because a lot of these, let's call them tools, 
to be clear, tools for torture, might not necessarily be traded. They might just be given by one state to another. Um, and then it's not covered by our instrument. And that's been a problem that we've found in the context of the arms trade treaty. But some states have said, well, it only covers things that we trade, but we're just going to give these arms. And you can see the context um, with Ukraine at the moment. But giving arms doesn't sound as weird, in fact, today as it might have done. So my sort of plea would be in thinking about this, not to concentrate too much on rules for licensing and trade, but to think about the production, to ban that, to, product, to ban the use, as has been mentioned obviously several times, but also to ban loans and leases. Um, you know, we'll lend you these for a while and then you give them back. That needs to be covered too. And there are a few potential loopholes um, that would be worth thinking about. The other thing to think about would be some of the existing law, not necessarily the arms trade treaty, which I'll come to, but some of the existing law on the crime of torture, which Thomas mentioned. So an arms manufacturer that is manufacturing some of the goods that Michael was referring to would be liable for torture, not because they would be the ones implementing it, but because the torture convention states that each state party shall ensure that all acts of torture are offences under its criminal law, and the same applies to an act by any person which constitutes complicity in torture. So the International Commission of Jurists, uh, well represented in this room and online, has a big project on complicity in international crimes. And it is quite possible to construct a case against the directors of the company, or indeed the company itself, for complicity in torture, for all of the things that we've been talking about. And there I would add that I would include not just complicity in torture as a human rights crime, but complicity in the war crime of torture or the crime against humanity. And I mention that because most states will have legislation prohibiting the war crime of torture, and they will have secondary legislation on complicity in those crimes. And it will often be easier to prosecute complicity in war crimes and complicity in crimes against humanity than indeed the crime of torture, which many states choose not to integrate into their national legislation. So we can all agree that it's prohibited. But the sort of devil, if you like, is in the detail. And so I would not underestimate the possibility of using existing criminal law, but thinking um, a bit creatively. And then there would be the possibility of civil suits, both against the company um, and against individuals. You could use the, victim protect the Torture Victim Protection Act, the Alien Tort Statute. There would be all sorts of ways to think about bringing complaints at the national level. But I know that this is a panel about a new international instrument, and so I shouldn't get too carried away with the prospects of domestic litigation. So what about the arms trade treaty? Could we, as Professor Krish asks, just use that? Why not? There are some of the instruments or tools, I should call them, um, that Michael has referred to that would be covered by the arms trade treaty. So rubber bullets and the pistol used to launch them would be considered arms under the arms trade treaty. So to the extent that those are being uh, traded, exported or imported, they could be prohibited if they could be, or there was a likelihood that they would be used to commit a serious human rights violation. The same would go for tear gas canisters and the instrument used to launch them. They would be considered um, projectiles, which is covered under the arms trade treaty. So for those, um, to the extent that you were dealing with a state party to the arms trade treaty, you could already um, start to complain that these were dual use weapons, as has been said, but that in the context of sending them to country X, there was likelihood that they would be used to commit serious violations of human rights, and therefore there should be no license or export of it. The problem comes with some of the other um, Tools for torture that you've mentioned, uh, police batons, barbed truncheons, electric shock belts, sound machines, tasers, and so on. They would not be covered under the arms trade treaty because the way the treaty is written, they're not considered projectiles that are sort of projected from a, a gun. Um, so you could say, well, I consider them to be arms, but the conventional wisdom is, and I checked it in the commentary to the arms trade treaty, and I, I even made a couple of phone calls to make sure I wasn't misleading anyone. These would not be covered under the arms trade treaty, um, just because they, they don't fall within the idea of projecting something. Even a taser, though 
it projects, obviously, the little darts is not considered to fall within the arms trade treaty. So probably we need something that looks a bit more like, um, I hope I'm not getting into deep water here, the landmines treaty, um, where you are prohibiting um, the production of these things, the barbed uh, truncheon or the electric shock belt, and one is not uh, thinking about the dual use arms trade treaty style. Uh, I think you want something uh, new. And one way in which I think one could sort of get a bit ahead of the curve is not just to concentrate on the international instrument, but also to start to think about a model law. Um, and that could be something that could be developed at the Human Rights Council, where you would explain, you would just give states a sort of cut and paste law that they could use at the national level, rather than taking the language from a treaty, which in, in my view often doesn't lend itself to the sort of things that you need in national law. So you would I mean, the landmine treaty prohibits the use of landmines. It doesn't say much about what you need to do to criminalize their use at the national level or their production and so on. So you could sort of give it a bit of a jump start um, at, at the Human Rights Council. And I suppose this is a suggestion to the special rapporteur for her, her report um, to start to think about model laws. So um, in finishing, I suppose the benefits of an ATT style treaty is that you can prohibit the export of these things, which, as you say, might have a legitimate use. Um, and you can prohibit it in a way that says, well, if we have reasonable grounds to believe that they're going to be used to commit a human rights violation, then it is prohibited to export them, lend them, lease them, gift them. And I would you know, have as long a list as you can possibly think of, because somebody will come up um, with a loophole. Um, and then one last thought, I think in Constructing this new instrument, one thing that we failed to do in the arms trade treaty is to have a monitoring body. And I think it's worth thinking whether it's a body of the Human Rights Council or a body of the General Assembly or a body of the state's parties, but a group of people, not states, um, some sort of expertise that would monitor compliance with this new set of commitments. And I would even go a step further and give that body some delegated authority to hear complaints. Because the arms trade treaty is very well, but it's proven ridiculously hard to challenge states' decisions. And if there was a place you could go, a bit like you register a complaint with the torture committee under the individual complaints mechanism, this state has been torturing people, and then a group of experts can sit in it, um, I feel it would focus states' minds much more than just congratulating themselves on concluding an instrument. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, and yeah. thank you, Andrew. This is really fascinating, and it takes us farther than uh, some of the discussions I was actually thinking about uh, having today. That's why I'm going to maybe switch a bit the order and maybe think about the reflections about what the potential treaty could look like, because I think you're really starting us off at a great moment. Uh, to turn that, you know, to, to pivot it towards the future. And um, I mean, range of experts, right? So we are very privileged to have you all here. I was wondering, like, instead of like maybe asking one by one, can we also have a conversation around this topic? Like, what do you say in response to Andrew's comments about different ways of getting there? Maybe some, uh, like, asker who thought about it longer in the report can start us off and then we can turn the others as well. Would that work, asker? Sure, I can, uh, I can try, so it's not <laughs> the easiest uh, task. I think, the, uh, do, Michael, do you want to speak now, or, or was it more, Mark? Uh... Actually, Michael can also, yeah, because he was actually, you me mute, mute, mute. Yeah, sorry, um, Asger, I'm happy to speak uh, straight after you. It, it was in uh, response to Andrew's um, uh, intervention. Well, why don't you go then? Because I was going to go a bit broader. So if you are responding directly, let's 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 get the conversation started. Then. Okay, great. Yeah. So it was just um, some some uh, uh, quick uh, thoughts. Um, so, firstly, absolutely um, agree with the need um, to cover all uh, the potential actors of concern. So not just uh, commercial companies who who manufacture and uh, export the goods, but also, as, as Andrew said, 
um, the states who are engaged in um, transferring uh, goods um, uh, uh, through uh, loans or gifts or as part of uh, security sector reform processes in, in, in third um, countries. Um, also, um, it's a really important link to that um, to look at the range of activities uh, that we want to uh, try and um, uh, cover. So again, that would be uh, with regards to, to uh, standard law enforcement equipment, that would be exports and transit of those goods through countries. But also we need to look at uh, regulation of the arms fairs, where these deals are made, um, the activities of brokers who arrange these deals, and uh, transportation agents as well. Um, and all these uh, um, activities sort of... Uh, get to the sophistication of uh, the complexity of the trade, but they also are potential breakpoints where states can exert control to stop um, transfers um, that will facilitate torture and overall treatment. So in a way, the complexity of the trade aids um, states who, who would be willing to, to do something about this to um, influence and uh, uh, um, regulate and stop in certain um, cases the trade. So that needs to be th thought about. Um, and then with regards to um, um, uh, inherently abusive um, goods, as, as, as Andrew said again, uh, it's very important not just to think about prohibiting uh, the trade and use, but also, of course, the manufacture and the promotion of these inherently abusive goods. And also, um, I would like to get people thinking about the possibility of destroying all existing stockpiles of inherently abusive goods, because they're inherently abusive. You've got things that are you know, existing in, in, in warehouses. Um, <laughs> what are you going to do with them? The, whilst they still exist, a, there is the potential that they will be used in country or that they will be transferred um, illicitly. So that's another step beyond what, what um, Andrew was saying. And I think it's very, very important for an instrument to do both the things uh, that Andrew said. So it's in terms of um, the landmine convention, ban the inherently abusive uh, equipment, but you also need and this um, sort of gets to what Asgo was saying, you also need to regulate the trade in the standard law enforcement equipment, like, the, like in the ATT, because it's the standard law enforcement equipment which is um, frequently uh, misused around the world, day in and day out, for uh, um, human rights uh, abuses, excessive use of force, that in some cases result in torture and of real treatment. So just concentrating on the inherently abusive equipment would um, do us all a disservice, I think. So this instrument needs to be uh, twofold. And I I'm sorry that it adds to the, to the sophistication of, of what's, what the answer is. But because the trade is <coughs> uh, complex, I think the answer needs to be uh, complex as well. Uh, yeah, so that's my initial response to, to Andrew. I'll leave others to, to, to follow that. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you. Should we turn to others? Like, whoever wants to go right now. Well, Oscar, I do can, you want to come in? I can yeah. go now. If, uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so, okay, so I think, I guess, two points. The first, I, so I've spent uh, a good part of the last 15 years of my life working with uh, the UN treaty body system. And uh, both with individual bodies, with the very, very long reform process and so on. And while the system has a lot of flaws, it is quite unique in the, the level of scrutiny and, let's say, oversight that states actually allow an independent UN body to do. So I think however we move forward in this, it will be very important to think about how the different treaty bodies or the models that have been created in the system, how they can actually be used for monitoring. That being said, we need to think about it in a very precise way because we are here, again, probably in a 
in an area of law that would be operating with a different evidentiary standard. But it also again comes down to the question of what is it that we will end up monitoring? So for example, if it is the functioning of national trade uh, regulatory bodies or something like that, uh, you could think about the subcommittee for prevention of torture that actually has a lot of experience with that kind of secondary monitoring or whatever we want to call it. Um, but but again, it's it's more. Um, I mean, there's still a lot of outstanding issues, and that takes me to the second point, because I think probably the biggest lesson learned from the work in the group is that we are currently operating in a very, very big political vacuum. Yeah? There are major questions. And that was, so the, U, the, the group of governmental experts, if you just listen to the name of the group, it's a little bit of an absurdity. What am I? Am I government or am I expert, right? And, and that had a big influence on the work of the group because some group members primarily saw their role as representing government positions or regional group positions or perceived regional group positions and others saw their role as being experts but but a lot of the questions that were before the group were impossible to resolve because they are inherently political questions that have not been dealt with by states yet and and so 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 it's a little bit when we think about designing this i think there are some major outstanding questions that 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 are so politicized that states really need to get around the table and uh, and put their opinions forward in order for then the technicality of saying okay how do we monitor how do uh, to to really come come into play but but uh, so so really i guess from my side uh, we are at a point now where uh, where we need the states to to come forward and uh, and have a discussion, but uh, yeah, but those are the two main points. Yeah, I think my my colleagues have covered a lot. The one thing I would mention is I look back to the defence cooperation clause that India tried to introduce in the arms trade treaty negotiations, and it, it's exactly that point of you know what you're trying to cover, there will be many different ways that states attempt to bypass that. So I think lessons learned will definitely be taken forward into this. And one of the things that we find interesting and exciting about this process is it does straddle both. It's trade and it's human rights, but it has to be led by the human rights people from where we sit, definitely, because the reason we're doing this, let's not forget, is because of the thousands and thousands of people that are suffering torture unnecessarily, where there is a way to stop it. So we don't have, like, it's not a panacea. It isn't going to solve everything. But this is a concrete action that states can take together. And our colleague from the EU, Thomas, mentioned there were 30 organisations in January that came together to advocate for a treaty. That number's grown to over 50 now that we're responding to the Special Rapporteur's torture report. And there are many, many more coming on board. The leadership of the EU, Argentina and Mongolia of the Alliance for Torture Free Trade is really inspiring. The group of 63 governments that they have around them is cross-regional, it is diverse and it will grow. It was one of those groups that suffered a little under the pandemic and there were so many other pressures on governments that this process stalled for a little while. But if you think about it, we're not that many years away from the 29 resolution that established the group of governmental experts that ASCA chaired. Momentum from that report needs to be found, and the next stage has to be moving towards negotiation of a legally binding instrument. So Amnesty, along with our partners in the Torture Free Trade Network of Civil Society, will be pushing for that quite robustly. Yeah. 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 Um, sorry, well, no, just by sort of way of summary of what was said to try and pull it a bit together, I mean, I suppose what we're talking about then is a a treaty in three parts, where the first part would have a sort of, I'll call it landmine style prohibitions on manufacture and use, but also, as Michael says, with provisions for destruction. So these are things which inherently cause torture, which ought to be just banned outright. And then you'd have a sort of second part, which looks a bit more like the arms trade treaty, where things could arguably be legitimate, but you want to ban the transfer where there's a serious risk 
that it could be used uh, to commit a human rights violation or a war crime or a violation of IHL. And then you'd use this other idea of dual use and you're sort of looking to the future as to how it's going to be used. And that's when this burden of proof thing comes in. And then the third part would look a bit like, as was being suggested, uh, a human rights treaty body where you've got experts that can hear complaints, that can review procedures, but I like the idea, can arguably go you know, and visit sites and, and talk to people like the subcommittee on, on torture. So, as you say, we could have some lessons learned here. Instead of saying this is what a banning instrument looks like, is to use all of those techniques um, within one single instrument, which to me looks wonderful. Can I continue uh, just for a moment on uh, on the theme? I think kind of the structure that seems kind of seems very promising. Um, now, one question I think that arises from the arms trade treaty, which obviously kind of is, as we also heard from Michael in the beginning, right? So the dual, potentially dual use tools are the biggest, uh, biggest part of the problem, really. Uh, and kind of how to tackle them depends to a large extent to how to differentiate target destinations, right? So how, how bad are they or how likely is it that they are committing rights violations with them? Now, in a sense, you know, I can I can see very much kind of how we would have an expert committee kind of in assessing kind of individual human rights violation in a particular case, but uh, and in theory I can also understand how an expert committee like a human rights committee style committee could uh, could differentiate between different countries. But I can see that politically, kind of that kind of differentiation to say well you are the A list and you are the B list or you are the C list is enormously difficult to do. So that would be a very different different task really for a body like that to do. And uh, I'm wondering kind of whether that's really a way that we can expect governments to go, or is that, is that something that a committee like that would be able to take on? I know anybody who can. You want to say? <laughs> I would just, just, just thinking, you know, like, but don't we have courts doing that already for reformant process, as Oscar mentioned? They are assessing risks, right? They're assessing that we cannot send this person to that particular country where they can be tortured. Sorry, I didn't want to answer your question as a moderator, but I just want to maybe plug Oscar back in this conversation, but maybe together with you as well. This is something that you can also talk about. No, no I agree with you. Courts all the time do that. assess future risk. If this person is sent to Somalia, What's the likelihood that they would be tortured? And so you're just doing exactly the same thing. If these police buttons are sent to country X, what's the likelihood that they will be used to commit torture? And the committee could say, well, you, I don't know, the United Kingdom, you should have realized because Amnesty International has produced 15 reports on people being beaten up in protests in this country with these buttons. So when you sent it, you were in violation of your torture-free treaty obligation. So you're not ranking the destination, really. You're ranking the person who's agreed to the transfer based on the information that they have or should have had, which is, is quite a complex exercise because they will say, well, how could we know what would happen in the future? And the answer is, well, Amnesty told you. So in a sense, it would really be a review of due diligence, right? Yeah. That countries have to do about their transfers. And it would be by transfers in the wide, in the wide sense. It would be binary, yeah. And I think as well, it wouldn't be complete blanket per country. So for the arms trade treaty, we look at a particular end user in a particular geographical location. We would, we're not at the stage of that level of detail in what we're proposing for, for the torture free trade treaty, because it does involve states coming around the table. I know Michael in particular has spent a lot of time thinking about this though, and would probably have quite a clear vision of what that final document would look like. But we would be looking at assessing the potential risk that a, a police force in a particular area, there's a high likelihood that they are going to continue to have behaviour that we have already seen demonstrated. On the evidentiary standard that Asga was talking about, and we've spoken about this as well, I think, you know, there's a very high threshold that's spoken about in the UN fact-finding missions. Not sure that that's what we would be arguing for when it came to the negotiation of the actual treaty language. And as you know, definitions in this type of thing are overriding risk, still not really defined. It would be quite a complicated discussion, but one that should put how do we prevent the harm at the core of what states are bringing forward to try and decide. Yeah. Should we also hear from uh, Special Reporter Alice Edwards at this moment? 
Okay, thanks very much. And this is all uh, very interesting and uh, informative, of course. Um, I had a, oh uh, to offer a question back. I mean, Asger and I both independently have thought about this non uh provision and whether the, the same kind of standards could be uh, used in terms of uh, when it is prohibited to send goods uh, uh, very unlike sending people, but using the same uh, standard. Um, but one of the, the questions I have um, that I would like to address in the report, if I can, is a question of temporal immediacy. So whether we need to um, have some kind of language around that the assessment, and this is for the control group, uh, or the controlled category of goods, a presently or imminent risk of being misused or misapplied. So you have ongoing crises. And then on the other hand, we obviously have situations where we have regular abusers. And here I'm thinking again in, in the non reformal asylum context, we have these lists of countries where it, there is a risk of sending uh, someone back um, because they're on the list. Um, I'm sure at international level that would be much harder to elaborate, but it is interesting that we have a whole mechanism in the Human Rights Council that is either establishing commissions of inquiry, that might be a trigger for being on the, um, the list. Um, we also have resolutions around certain countries where that could be incorporated and so forth. So that was, so I wanted some feedback on that and what um, members of the panel uh, thought. Um, and related to that, or perhaps it's not related, but I am always in the back of my mind thinking about this question about sanctions. So mm. how does that relate to kind of sanctioning a country and therefore prohibiting the onward forwarding um, uh, of, of goods or the aid and so forth? And I take Andrew's point. I think it's absolutely imperative that we include um, gifting and aid and uh, all of, of the broad scope there. Um, and the second uh, question I wanted to raise was um, related on the monitoring bodies. I mean, we've had, and, and in some ways these are theoretical questions, right? Because this will depend on how this elaborates. But I think as the role in Special Rapporteur, I can inject a viewpoint uh, on this that may uh, be taken forward. And in terms of monitoring bodies, of course we have the Committee Against Torture, but they review states performance every four years, um, and that is apparently scheduled to move to eight years. I would like to see the Committee Against Torture start doing this. I think it is an existing obligation on states not to be complicit in uh, crimes of torture and the perpetration of uh, inhuman degrading treatment, no matter how it occurs. So. It would be, I think, um, anyone in the audience who is submitting uh, reports on different states, if, if they have that information, to actually start submitting and getting the committee. Um, they've, they've, I notice they've done it occasionally, but very occasionally, um, to draw on these issues. Um, so monitoring body versus a designation body and whether they would be the same thing, the body that decides if it's a treaty, then of course it probably the treaty, the conference of the states' parties that would decide on if there are lists on adding different equipment or alternatively adding different states onto those lists, etc. So I wanted wanted to hear a bit more about uh, the monitoring side of things if people have views on that. Thank you. <laughs> it might be. Yeah, oh. I'm happy to say something. Yeah, of course. Um, I feel a bit uncomfortable agreeing with the idea that one should be using the standard used by commissions of inquiry. I think there's a bit of a misunderstanding here. A commission of inquiry is concluding that an individual has done something which is essentially criminal. And so the sort of standard of proof that you want is quite high because you're trying somebody in the court of public opinion. And just to sort of confuse you a bit, the, the panels of experts that are set up by the Security Council um, to look in into, into individual sanctions actually use the standard of beyond reasonable doubt because um, you're essentially accusing somebody of committing a crime and preventing them from moving around the world. Now, now that is always, 
backward looking and that's an attribution of guilt and i think what you know from a human rights perspective one wants to be a bit careful about that from an individual rights perspective but here we're talking about preventing a harm of horrific nature to an individual in the future and i think we can afford to sort of reduce the standard of proof a bit based on what we're talking about we're talking about future action we're trying to prevent something from happening so we shouldn't be, oh, well, we can only prevent it if we're absolutely certain that it's going to happen. No, if you think somebody's about to be tortured, we should prevent it. So I think it's misleading to sort of pick and choose these uh, standards. I know that that's not what any of the people on this panel or online are, are suggesting, but I can see how in an international negotiation, people sort of look for something off the shelf that's kind of convenient. And I would really push back against that. It's a completely different exercise. If you want the exercise that it's closest to, which has been mentioned, in my view, it, it is non reformal But again, there you're up against the idea that states have an interest in sort of pushing people out. And, and some of these people they consider are dangerous to their local population. And so it's not the greatest test. Uh, there's no reason that a state has a big national interest in exporting a whole load of police batons. We're not, it's not even like the arms trade, where some states have a big economic interest that arguably you could say, you know, they're, they're protecting peace and security. But sending police batons abroad is not necessary and is not important to the state. So I don't think we should be, we should be careful about pick and mix. And then the other suggestion, um, again, I'm going to push back a bit. I know it wasn't being suggested uh, in the way it was floated rather than suggested. Um, of saying, well, you know, if a state has a commission of inquiry at the Human Rights Council, then that's a good indicator that um, things shouldn't be sent there. That, I think, is something that should not be pursued for the following reason. If you are a big, powerful state, there won't be a resolution against you at the Human Rights Council. That doesn't mean that you're not committing human rights violations. Take a hypothetical situation like demonstrations in Hong Kong. If we were to wait for a Human Rights Council resolution setting up a commission of inquiry into China, then we're saying there's no problem in Hong Kong for exporting police uh, equipment. So I'm really hesitant to put in the hands of the Human Rights Council the levers which determine whether or not the torture trade prohibitions go ahead. Sorry if that sounds a bit you know, overexcited, but... I can see what happens is that we, we sort of tend to go for things that are out there and I'll sort of be blunt about it. Having sat on a commission of inquiry, I would feel really uncomfortable with the idea that our standard of proof would be the standard of proof that would be used for prohibiting the export of certain torture weapons. Voila. Well, thank you. I see Oscar is like nodding. <laughs> Do you want to come in on this point? And after that, Michael, too, I think both of you want to say I, I, I think Michael was first. Um, sure. So it's just let him, uh, let him go. So go ahead, Michael. Okay, yeah. So, blimey, we're going off. Um, <laughs> so many uh, great ideas. Um, and, uh, yeah. Uh, so, to respond to um, uh, the uh, determining uh, risk assessment and 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 when transfers should and should not happen, and the idea of of lists of banned countries. I, I'm a bit worried about the idea of of having lists of 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 banned countries. I just think that that is going to be immense. Well, the whole thing is going to be political, but I think that's going to be immensely political and great power uh, politics coming into play about what countries do go on the list and what countries that should go on the list but are not never on the list um, so i would um uh, look at uh, um establishing the criteria and in the end um states are gonna they are going to want the sovereignty of decision making for themselves on this so i would suggest that work needs to be done on the criteria uh, uh, to determine um, when uh, a transfer should happen and should not happen. And uh, just going back to what Andrew said, uh, uh, this links to the range of sources that states uh, should be required to consider when making that decision. I think the decision rests with the state. The um, At the national level, the courts can judicially review state decisions if they are deemed uh, um, 
you know, to be wrong or, or, or to go against uh, the evidentiary, um, uh, um, uh, the evidence that's there. And then the idea of this international um, group of experts or, or monitoring body can review that as well. So that's on, on that side of things. Um, what was also very, very interesting was um, Alice's intervention about the need <laughs> for um, uh, flexibility in the system to um, immediately suspend transfers uh, uh, when there's an immediate risk that the goods will be used for uh, for torture. Uh, that links to um, a concern of, of ours with regard to the range of goods captured um, uh, by um, any treaty that you're going to need um, an agreed list of control goods and agreed list of prohibited goods but you do need um, to have um, an end use uh, clause, which basically says, oh, um, you know, we've it's come to our attention that this um, new sort of equipment is in danger of being transferred and it will facilitate or be used to inflict torture in a recipient state. It's not on the control list. It's not on the prohibited list, but we want to suspend that transfer. So that flexibility needs to be built into the system as well to make it work. And uh, to get to the idea of the system needs to be um, responsive to technological change, that the lists need to be um, uh, update, uh, reviewed and updated by a body, perhaps uh, this monitoring body or uh, another uh, group of experts um, uh, need to do that regularly to ensure that um, <laughs> the instrument isn't uh, captured by uh, and left behind uh, through technological advances. Uh, the other area that I'd like to just throw into the mix as well, as well as goods that need to be controlled or prohibited, um, is the idea that um, training and technical assistance needs to be addressed as well. So you, you know, we have previously found training in um, the misuse of law and standard law enforcement equipment and if that training is transferred and endorsed by um the superiors in the recipient countries it could um entrench abusive uh, practices such as the use of hog tying or or um uh, neck holds with batons so that's another um area for consideration and of course that training um, could be conducted by commercial companies, uh, but also could be conducted by states, um, uh, police training colleges, for example. So that's another set of activities that would be um, good to roll into uh, this issue, just to complicate things more. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Yeah, you... maybe just to follow up on... Yeah. yeah, maybe just to follow up on what what Andrew said, because I, I, I mean, I completely agree on the issues with the evidentiary standards. I mean, we need something that will actually provide effective protection. And I think maybe just, I guess, reiterating a bit what I said in the beginning, but but I think part of that, from our side, those that try to strategize to have an effective in, instrument, then we'll see where political negotiations go. But it, it has to be looking at this monitoring evidentiary standards and available information as a puzzle that needs to fit together, right? Because when we talk about, for example, the risk assessment in the Raffleman cases, you actually have many states that, like my own, uh, that, that very much want to send uh, people out. They spend a great deal of time collecting country of origin information. We also sometimes have cases where that information is collected in a very disingenuous way. But they do actually provide a very significant body of information and evidence that the decisions can be based on. We won't have that as a general for uh, it, we cannot expect that the states that would be part of this treaty would do the same kind of information collection on any country where there would be a request to export, um, uh, let's say, batons or, or whatever we are talking about. Right? So, so there's so there's something there around thinking not only about what's the effective evidential standard, but also what are the different sources of information that we are likely to have. And what kind of 
with what kind of rigor do they collect information so that hopefully that can actually play into an evidentiary standard. I don't know if I'm making uh, if I'm making sense. I hope so because it would be very sad to to see in the end. Also because we're talking two levels, right? We're talking okay, some international oversight body. What can they? What do they need in order to point the finger on somebody and saying you're not doing your job? And but more importantly. What do the national trade authorities need in order to tell a company you cannot do this? Right? And and if we, it would be very sad to have this wonderful instrument, but then absolutely no information, general information available to the especially to the national authorities to actually back decisions to block the trade. So 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 I think there's something there to really uh, think of it as a puzzle that needs to come together. That's it. Yeah. All right. So, uh, thanks, Don. I think we have lots of things on the table. Kind of a whole amount of fascinating questions about the uh, the starting point, uh, but especially about the design, right? Sort of how then actually to implement the broader idea uh, and get into the detail uh, where the devil tends to lie. So. Uh, so clearly, kind of lots of moving pieces, and obviously politically also, and kind of much much uh, moving ground really, uh, as regards the coalition and the potentially broader group of receptive states that might join a treaty like this. We wanted to use a bit of time really, kind of for a kind of a broader discussion about that and questions and answers from the audience. Uh, so whoever would like to come in, uh, please raise your hand and maybe identify yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Jack Pope. Um, I work with the Secretariat of the, the Committee Against Torture. Um, so, it, first of all, thanks for this discussion. It's rare that I've seen such a brainstorming happening in these kind of events. Um, but going back to the, you know, at some stage, Andrew, you, you drew out a blueprint of, of a potential treaty. Um, and there was a, quite a significant, you know, the third part was monitoring. Um, and going back to what you mentioned earlier on about the case for uh, state responsibility and complicity, or failing to prosecute complicity, failing to prevent complicity. So I'm wondering, you know, what are what are the deficiencies in the use of the Committee Against Torture and the Convention Against Torture for this kind of monitoring purpose now? Because, you know, you have the state review, you have the individual complaint procedure. What are the deficiencies in that, and why would you need a separate monitoring body? Should we take uh, two, maybe two more questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you. I'm Isabella Meicher. I'm a Sherry alumni and currently independent uh, consultant. I have actually a very quick question because at a certain point I got a bit lost in conversation. It's about the risk assessment. So in the envisioned uh, treaty, uh, I, I guess I'm addressing many Verity and Michael. Would you imagine that risk assessment being done at national level or at international by that monitoring an in, in independent body. Mm -hmm. the, there are also online participants. They are also free to ask, by the way. I'm turning to... Yeah, yeah. go ahead, Nico. Okay, I think we're here in the front. Uh, hi, thanks. I'm from the International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, thank you to the speakers and moderators and organizers for the discussion. Um, protection, uh, prevention of torture and other ill treatment is a key part of the work of the ICRC, particularly in the context of detention, in armed conflict, and other situations of violence. Uh, so we followed with great interest the progress of the initiative for torture-free trade. And I think as a lively discussion here today illustrates, there are of course many details that remain to be worked out in the process. Uh, but for the ICRC, we can already say at a general level that in principle the ICRC would support efforts towards a legally binding instrument that would prohibit trade and other transfers of goods uh, whose only practical use is torture and ill treatment, and that would regulate trade and other transfers of goods that may have legitimate law enforcement uses but are frequently used for such abuse. In our own work, uh, we often see that torture and other ill treatment are in fact inflicted, uh, not through specialized equipment, but uh, uh, with equipment that could also have legitimate law enforcement uses, so we definitely see the same things others are referring to, and in our view, any instrument to be effective uh, in addressing the issues would need, therefore, to somehow cover both kinds of uh, equipment. 
Uh, for us, I think this initiative presents the potential to build another important plank into the overall framework, legal framework, that aims at uh, countering torture and other ill treatment. At the same time, of course, torture and other ill treatment can very well be perpetrated with no access to any tools uh, of any kind or ordinary objects. So, uh, like others, we'll continue to emphasize the need for effective implementation of the already full range of, of legal obligations around torture. But I would suggest I think that's a question that all of us would be well advised to think through our answers to, because I think it's a question that people who might not already be convinced of the initiative may ask, since torture and treatment can be perpetrated with a piece of wood or a rock or a screwdriver, what in practice will the impact of, of this initiative be? I think we see the potential for a lot of impact, but I think that's a question we'd all be well served to be prepared uh, to answer. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, I don't know if there's anybody online. No? Uh, okay, well, I think so. We have enough material we can to go, go around the table, and maybe kind of whoever wants to come in on those questions, please uh, go ahead. <laughs> okay, ask and Michael both. Both kind of this time, maybe ask you go first and then Michael. Uh, so let me try to at least respond to a few of them. I think on the issue of the Committee Against Torture as uh, and its monitoring function in relation to this, I think from my side, the big question is more about, I, I think it can have a function. The question is more, what kind of function can it have? I, when you look at the state review process, it's really a, a dialogue where I, to be honest, I'm not sure that there is any evidentiary standard at all. Uh, uh, certainly not a consistent one. Um, so, so it is a it is a process that can generate information, uh, but but it's I mean I I question how one would rely on any kind of clear determination that would come out of the state review process. That being said. It can do a lot of other things in the state review process, such as look at are there, uh, is the National Trade Authority actually making decisions on this, for example. So this, let's say, a little bit more remote monitoring of, of the processes rather than the, the monitoring of, of individual situations. Of course, again, it, it, then it's different when you look at the, the individual decisions that are issued by the committee, where there's a much more clear uh, evidentiary standard being applied. Uh, but then the question is, how do, does that contribute or indicate risk of future abuse? Right? So, so it's not that, that the committee cannot have a role. I'm a big proponent of the treaty bodies and their role in, in monitoring. It's more about thinking through what role it can actually effectively uh, take. Um, so, so that was the one. I guess just one comment from me on on the observation by by ICRC. Um, I think what what we see in the work in ICT, which is my my normal job, is that there is a very significant amount of torture that happens not because the perpetrator necessarily wishes to torture the other person but as something that is incidental to something else. The, the, the wish to control crowds, uh, inability to control prison populations or unwillingness to invest in it. So I'm not saying that these are innocent people. You see, we work a lot, this is not so relevant here, but we work a lot on, on torture that happens in the context of, uh, of policing where the main, um, desire of the perpetrator is not to get information but to get a confession so they can meet crime solving targets so so there's a lot there are a lot of things that where we see torture taking place in a situation where you if you put the right conditions in, in place it wouldn't because the person does not inherently want to cause severe pain or suffering in the other individual. So, so, and I think I agree, there's a great need to explain that more, but I think from, from my side, that's where this treaty can really have a, a significant uh, impact in taking the tools out of the hands of people that, so that they will hopefully behave in a legal way without those tools. Yeah? So, but uh, that was a very short, uh, 
argument. But, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks, Margaret. Thanks. Um, yeah, so firstly to the question of uh, human rights risk assessment, um, we would envisage that that happens at the, um, at the national level, um, that a state determines um, that it um, um, compiles and analyzes all the relevant um, information about the human rights situation in, in the, the potential recipient country. Specifically, uh, these transfers of goods um, will be going to specific, uh, well, or they should be going to specific end users. So if that end user has a history of, of misusing uh, uh, such goods for human rights violations, um, including torture, then, you know, there, that would raise red flags about um, uh, subsequent uh, uh, transfers of such goods. And that those information sources shouldn't just be um, UN and regional organizations, but should definitely be um, relevant civil society um, organizations as well. Um, um, so, yeah, so that process should be done at the, at the national level. But the criteria, as well as the range of information sources, should be established uh, by the instrument. Um, uh, uh, learning from good practice, um, um, what's key as well, uh, as well as the public information sources that are, are out there, is the potential information sources that states parties can circulate amongst themselves. Um, when we look towards um, uh, regional instruments, you've got the EU anti-torture regulation, which um, has um, information uh, 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 provision as part of its process. It also has, which is interesting and may be able to be brought into this international instrument and no undercutting rule. So if um, an EU member state um, decides that uh, a transfer of, uh, bum, 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 um, I don't know, um, batons or whatever, even though batons aren't included at the moment in the regulation, but uh, uh, batons uh, to um, state X shouldn't happen because there is a, uh, um, a substantial risk that those batons will be used, uh, misused for torture or other ill treatment, then any other EU member state needs to consult with that first member state if it wants to then transfer batons to that recipient country. And... Um, will have to justify why it considers the situation has changed or the recipient uh, won't use those batons for torture. Um, and such a process will would help uh, um, uh, share information about concerns, but also could be a break on states uh, um, sending uh, goods which are going to be used for torture. So that's uh, just another uh, mechanism that might be uh, useful for, for the instrument. Um, as regards um, uh, the intervention uh, from the ICRC, uh, we, you know, which is fantastic um, 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 in its support of the issue and uh, 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 a torture-free trade treaty. Um, yeah, it's a real point about, well, anything can be misused for torture. That, you know, obviously true. But those things uh, like baseball bats and metal bars and batteries and all the rest of it, they shouldn't be in the armories of law enforcement uh, um, officials and, and forces. And if they're ever found in the armories, uh, um, then, you know, the, um, uh, then the uh, users uh, need to go to jail and, you know, that should never happen. But standard law enforcement equipment is going to be in the armory of law enforcement officials. Uh, so you need a process to control that equipment, um, its use and its trade as well. And also with some of this law enforcement equipment, uh, unlike a baseball bat, you know, it can be used to affect, uh, punish whole crowds uh, at once as well like tear gas, like uh, multiple kinetic impact projectiles. S and, and there are advances um, in the technology that will allow um, the dispersal of riot control agents to far greater ranges to, that will cover far greater areas that will affect uh, far um, uh, greater numbers of people uh, at one time. So this technology is advancing and it needs to be controlled. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Gotcha. Alice?
Yes, great. Um, I just wanted to, I think the, the first two questions were, uh, have already had some views on and I'll reserve mine on those. Um, I just wanted to um, respond to uh, Matt's from ICRC's uh, comments. And I think, and it also relates back to these early comment about free, the torture free trade or the torture free free trade agreement. Um, clearly the aim is not to disrupt trade overall. And I think for political messaging, we also need to be, you know, broad in that, that there is trade in needed goods for legitimate purposes and that this is a check on those goods so that they're not put to nefarious purposes. And also uh, related to that, that ordinary household items uh, will not fall within this regime. And that gets me to the point around language. And I think I would make an appeal and I'll do the best I can in my own report to be clear on the language we're using. And here we, keep referring regularly to law enforcement equipment and weapons and devices, et cetera, or items or goods and so forth. I'm more worried about the law enforcement part because I think we, and I certainly would want this to apply to all detention prisons and places where persons are uh, deprived of their liberty, including psychiatric institutions. So I think we would need to kind of have have some language that is agreeable and that frames it without being, you know, overly long and uh, and long and long winded. And likewise, uh, you know, this language of dual use, um, which is generally used dual use treaties, where there's uh, some overlap versus dual use within this convention, this potential convention itself. So somehow. Um, the dual use of things, whether for law enforcement or for torture, I think we we need to perhaps stick to some of the trade language uh, on that. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to um, end um, from my side, at least, to say thank you very much for uh, this event. I really think um, working on this area, the the goal, of course, is that you know, to reduce or minimize trade and the production and use of items that should be prohibited or uh, could be used uh, for human rights violations. And of course, although that's not going to eradicate torture entirely, because we know that the limits of torture are only as far as the the perversion of the perpetrator or the aggression of the perpetrator, I think if we can get certain goods off the market, out of production, and monitoring continuous production and uh, innovation around goods, because we know that in all areas of life, everything's becoming more and more sophisticated. I don't think um, uh, we have seen the end yet of kind of the, the elaboration of new uh, law enforcement and other uh, equipment. Um, so I'm, I'm very pleased that uh, we've had this uh, event today. I thank you very much. I'm not saying I'm saying the last remarks, but just from my side, um, thank you very much for all the great thoughts and ideas, and I'll certainly reflect uh, on those closely. So thank you very much. It's an exciting moment. I think, you know, I've, I've really enjoyed this discussion and Andrew, you'll be hearing from me uh, very soon. And, um, you know, everybody on the screen and everybody you've brought together, Esgi, has been working on this in one way or another for quite a long time. But now we have the GG report, we have the political momentum, we have the lessons learned. It would be really great for the community to take the next step and, and to move this forward. And we look forward to the next meeting of the Alliance for Torture Free Trade and as civil society, just very ready to support, to offer any assistance we can. Because like the Special Rapporteur of Torture said, you know, we think this is one way where we will be able to have a direct concrete impact on torture as experienced by individuals. So thank you for the opportunity to be with everyone today, Eski. Right. Yeah, I just I also want to thank everyone here. Uh, we were all here in Geneva, but we had followers in uh, New York and Brussels and DC. Thank you all for being here. And I want to especially thank our speakers. They did a great job. This was 
very informative, but I also like the brainstorming fashion that you, uh, someone from the audience mentioned, and that brought me all this energy and excitement about the road ahead, and I definitely share Verity's excitement about that. So we, today we discussed a lot of things. We talked about the gravity of this uh, tools and the, the use of these tools, and then we talked about um, a three-part treaty that <laughs> I, I like that idea of mixing landmines really and ATT and adding a monitoring mechanism I think that was a brilliant blueprint that some of us can work on as well and we discussed also about risk assessment and how important it is and different ways uh, of getting there so I also agree with Verdi that right now we are in a very special and a very good moment to keep on this momentum and then continue and the next stop is obviously special reporter on torture's report we are all very much looking forward to receiving that report and reading it so that we can uh, take the next step. So I would just say onwards and upwards from now on. Yeah. Okay. There's little to add to that. Uh, really fascinating discussion, uh, I thought, kind of, uh, my, kind of one, one element that I thought we didn't take up so much and maybe the next discussion I can take it from is the, the question of business in all of that, right? So that's very stage focused, most of kind of the, uh, framework and the various of the speakers kind of highlighted, kind of, the, of course, the very important role of business, not the only important actors, um, but of course, in the context of a greater shift towards responsibilities or obligations of, uh, of businesses, that might be something to be considered for an agreement uh, of that kind, because it's not only states that may need to do risk assessment, but also the companies that produce all those items um, that might afterwards face consequences. Of paying. Uh, if they don't do that. Um, I also thought, uh, I think kind of that's really kind of worth pushing at, is the question of the impact and where the impact can be strongest. I think that's clearly, clearly the, symbolic, uh, the, the symbolic effect of a treaty of that sort, I think, would be, it would be tremendously important. Um, I think kind of there's still some work to be done to think about kind of what is, kind of how would we have to go about many of those kind of items that are easy to produce, kind of how to regulate their trade effectively without easy substitution effects, kind of so that whoever wants to produce them produces them if the ones that kind of join the regime kind of do not produce them. In a sense, it's a fact, as a practical matter, I think it's quite a different market than it might be for the arms trade treaty, right, where you talk about very sort of high-end, difficult to produce uh, items, right? So of here we're in a bit of a different context. And I think it's probably worth to consider a little, little bit further kind of how one can actually effective, effectively regulate a market of that sort. But I think it's great that we have that momentum. Uh, it's clear that the path is staked out uh, and uh, that the kind of broader framework is somewhat defined. There's a sort of key momentum around a kind of significant number of critical mass really of actors. Uh, and, uh, on with stuff with thank you all uh, for being with us tonight uh, thanks for the audience and uh, yeah hope to continue the conversation soon yeah thank you